The Sinking of the Titanic from The Times, 28th of April, 1912. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording read by Andy Minter. Mr. Bruce Ismay of the White Star Line gave out the following prepared statement on the pier. In the presence and under the shadow of this catastrophe of the sea, which overwhelmed my feelings too deeply for expression in words, I can only say that the White Star officers and employees will do everything humanly possible to alleviate the sufferings and sorrow of relations and friends of those who perished. The Titanic was the last word in shipbuilding. Every regulation prescribed by the British Board of Trade had been strictly complied with. The master, officers, and crew were the most experienced and skilful in the British service. I am informed that a committee of the United States Senate has been appointed to investigate the circumstances of the accident. I heartily welcome a most complete and exhaustive inquiry, and any aid which I and my associates and our builders and navigators can render is at the service of the public and the government, both in the United States and in Great Britain. Under these circumstances I must defer making any further statement at this hour. Mr. Ismay said informally, before giving out his statement, that he left the ship in the last boat, one of the collapsible boats on the starboard side. "'I do not know the speed at which the Titanic was going,' said Mr. Ismay, in reply to a question. "'She hit the iceberg at a glancing blow.' Mr. Ismay went to his rooms at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Asked to tell the circumstances in which he left the Titanic, Mr. Ismay said that a boat was lowered in which most of the passengers were women, and that when the officers in charge called for more women and there was no response, he took a place in the boat. He declared that apparently there were no other passengers in that part of the vessel. Asked how long he had remained in the ship after the collision, he said, when pressed for an answer, that he thought he remained about an hour, or an hour and a quarter, or perhaps longer. Soon after the collision he visited the bridge, where he found Captain Smith had already arrived. He further stated that he believed that the ice had struck the vessel between the bow and the bridge. He described the method of loading and lowering the boats, but his testimony in regard to what happened after he left the ship is hardly more valuable than that of other level-headed survivors, and I have therefore used it to strengthen the following narratives in the compilation of which no facts have been used unless supported by at least two witnesses. The Ascertained Facts All accounts agree that the night, though moonless, was starry, that the atmosphere was unusually clear, and the sea absolutely calm when the disaster occurred. Nearly all accounts agree that the Titanic was going at a great pace, though on this important point a final judgment may well be reserved, pending official details. There is substantial agreement, too, that Captain Smith was not on duty at the time of the accident, his place being taken by the first officer. The majority of the survivors note with surprise the slightness of the shock, a fact which corroborates, apparently, the well-substantiated report that the Titanic did not strike an iceberg head-on. As to the nature of the iceberg, there is serious divergence of opinion. Several survivors talk of the deck being littered with splinters of ice, which would point to a big berg. This theory is supported by accounts according to which some passengers saw a berg as the vessel passed it after the impact. If it was really a big berg, it would appear that the Titanic must have been struck by a submerged ledge. In competent quarters in New York, an alternative theory is propounded, that the ice was what is called a blue berg growler, a mass, that is to say, of nearly submerged ice of a semi-transparent nature. This, it is felt, might, in conjunction with the smoothness of the water and the height above water of the lookout in the crow's nest, and of the officers on the bridge, account for the fact that the obstruction apparently was not detected until the vessel was within a quarter of a mile of it, though it is said that with the smooth sea and the atmospheric conditions which existed, it would have been possible for a big berg to have been practically invisible at a short distance. The fact that the Titanic had certainly part of the starboard side below the waterline and possibly part of the bottom ripped out 
would fit, of course, either theory. It must be remembered, however, that all this is only speculation, and will remain so, pending an authoritative statement of some kind or other. Belief in the ship. The shock caused practically no alarm among the passengers, though one of the surviving stokers is reported to have said that water immediately poured into the fire-room. It was not till the engine stopped a moment later that any disquiet was felt. Even then there was absolutely no panic, at any rate among the first-class passengers. The belief in the unsinkability of the Titanic was firmly rooted, and an idea was apparently current that an iceberg had been merely grazed. The only alarming feature was the roar of the exhausts, as the boilers were emptied of steam. The fires, too, were apparently drawn, the stokers responding to orders with the utmost bravery. The order, all passengers on deck with life-belts on, came about half an hour after the collision. Sailors almost simultaneously began to prepare the boats. Even then, signs of real alarm were conspicuously absent. If, as alleged in some quarters, the first boats to leave the ship carried more than their normal complement of the crew, this was probably due to the fact that passengers could not be brought to leave the ship. It is said that some people even went back to bed. The electric light, meanwhile, was acting perfectly, and continued to do so until the end. When the boats on deck B were prepared, the order was given, All men stand back, all women go down to B deck. The men stood back on the deck, at any rate without any sign of panic. Ten minutes later, when it was seen that no women were left, at least on one side of deck B, a few men jumped from the starboard deck A to the boats below. Mr. Ismay, it will be remembered, alluded to some such situation in his testimony, and in this other accounts agree substantially. Nowhere is there anything but praise for the splendid discipline of the officers and crew, nor can any words express the admiration which is commanded by practically all the multitudinous accounts dealing with the conduct of the passengers, both men and women. When magnificent courage and sang-froid were the rule, it is almost invidious to mention names, but some examples of what I mean will be given later. THE SINKING OF THE VESSEL The accounts of the sinking of the vessel differ. One trustworthy witness tells me that he heard no explosion, and from his position in a boat two miles away he could not see anything to lead him to believe that the vessel broke in two. It seemed to him that she sank vertically by her bows after a period of sickening suspense, during which those who were left on board had to cling prone to the decks. Mr. Ismay and various other level-headed people also deny that they heard any explosion, but nevertheless the story is widely current that the boilers blew up and the ship divided. Survivors' Stories Mr. Beasley's Graphic Account The Scene When the Vessel Went Down New York, April the 18th, 11.45 p.m. The following account of the disaster is given by Mr. Beasley, who till lately was a master at Dulwich College. The voyage from Queenstown was quiet and successful. We had met with very fine weather. The sea was calm, and the wind was westerly to southwesterly the whole way. The temperature was very cold, particularly on the last day. In fact, after dinner on Sunday evening it was almost too cold to be on the deck at all. I had been in my berth about ten minutes, when at about a quarter past ten I felt a slight jar. Then soon afterwards there was a second shock, but it was not sufficiently large to cause any alarm. The engines, however, stopped immediately afterwards. At first I thought that the ship had lost a propeller. I went up on deck in my dressing-gown, and I found only a few people there who had come up in the same way to inquire why we had stopped, but there was no sort of anxiety in the mind of any one. We saw through the smoking-room window that a game of cards was going on, and I went in to ask if they knew anything. They had noticed the jar a little more, and looking through the window had seen a huge iceberg go by close to the side of the boat. They thought that we had just grazed it with a glancing blow, and they had been to see if any damage had been done. None of us, of course, had any conception that she had been pierced below by part of a submerged iceberg. The game of cards was resumed, and without any thought of disaster I retired to my cabin to read until we started again. I never saw any of the players or the onlookers again. A little later, hearing people going upstairs, I went out again, and found that everybody wanted to know why the engines had stopped. 
No doubt many of them had been awakened from their sleep by the sudden stopping of the vibration to which they had become accustomed during those four days we had been on board. Going up on the deck again, I saw that there was an unmistakable list downwards from the stern to the bows, but knowing nothing of what happened, I concluded that some of the front compartments had filled and had weighed her down. Again I went down to my cabin, where I put on some warmer clothing. As I dressed, I heard the order shouted, "'All the passengers on deck with life-belts on.' We all walked up slowly with the life-belts tied on over our clothing, but even then we presumed that this was merely a wise precaution the captain was taking, and that we should return in a short time to go to bed. There was a total absence of any panic or expression of alarm." I suppose this must be accounted for by the exceeding calmness of the night, and the absence of any signs of an accident. The ship was absolutely still, and except for the gentle tilt downwards, which I do not think one person in ten would have noticed at the time, there were no visible signs of the approaching disaster. She lay just as if waiting for the order to go on again when some trifling matter had been adjusted. But in a few moments we saw the covers being lifted from the boats, and the crews allotted to them standing by and uncoiling the ropes which were to lower them. We then began to realise that it was a more serious matter than we had at first supposed. My first thought was to go down to get more clothing and some money, but seeing people pouring up the stairs I decided that it was better to cause no confusion to people coming up by attempting to get to my cabin. Preparations for Leaving Presently we heard the order, all men stand back away from the boats, all ladies retire to the next deck below, which was the smoking-room, or B-deck. The men all stood away, and waited in absolute silence, some leaning against the end railings of the deck, others pacing slowly up and down. The boats were then swung out, and lowered from A-deck. When they were level with B-deck, where all the women were collected, the women got in quietly, with the exception of some who refused to leave their husbands. In some cases they were torn from their husbands and pushed into the boats, but in many instances they were allowed to remain, since there was no one to insist that they should go. Looking over the side, one saw the boats from aft already in the water, slipping quietly away into the darkness. Presently the boats near me were lowered, with much creaking as the new ropes slipped through the pulleys and blocks down the ninety feet which separated them from the water. An officer in uniform came up as one boat went down and shouted out, "'When you're afloat, row round to the companion ladder and stand by with other boats for orders.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' came up the reply. But I do not think any boat was able to obey the order, for when they were afloat and had their oars at work, the condition of the rapidly settling line there was much more apparent. In common prudence, the sailors saw that they could do nothing but row away from the sinking ship, and so save, at any rate, some lives. They, no doubt, anticipated that the suction from such an enormous vessel would be more than usually dangerous to the crowded boat, which was mostly filled with women. No trace of disorder. All this time there was no trace of any disorder. There was no panic or rush to the boats, and there were no scenes of women sobbing hysterically such as one generally pictures happening at such times. Everyone seemed to realise so slowly that there was imminent danger, that when it was realised that we might all be presently in the sea with nothing but our life-belts to support us until we were picked up by passing steamers, it was extraordinary how calm everyone was, how completely self-controlled we were, as one by one the boats, filled with women and children, were lowered and rowed away into the night. Presently word went round among us that men were to be put in boats on the starboard side. I was on the port side. Most of the men walked across the deck to see if this was true. I remained where I was, and shortly afterwards I heard the call, "'Any more ladies?' Looking over the side of the ship, I saw boat number thirteen swinging level with B-deck. It was half full of women. Again the call was repeated. "'Any more ladies?' I saw none coming. Then one of the crew looked up and said, "'Any ladies on your deck, sir?' "'No,' I replied. "'Then you'd better jump,' said he. I dropped and fell into the bottom of the boat as they cried, "'Lower away!' As the boat began to descend, two ladies were pushed hurriedly through the crowd on B-deck, and a baby, ten months old, was passed down after them. Then down we bent, the crew shouting out directions to those lowering us. Level! Aft! 
Stern, both together, until we were some ten feet from the water. Here occurred the only anxious moment we had during the whole of our experience, from the time of our leaving the deck to our reaching the Carpathia. A lifeboat in danger. Immediately below our boat was the exhaust of the condensers, and a huge stream of water was pouring all the time from the ship's side just above the water line. It was plain that we ought to be smart away from it if we were to escape swamping when we touched the water. We had no officers on board, and no petty officer or member of the crew to take charge, so one of the stokers shouted, "'Someone find the pin which releases the boat from the ropes and pull it up!' No one knew where it was. We felt as well as we could on the floor and along the sides, but found nothing. It was difficult to move among so many people. We had sixty or seventy on board. Down we went, and presently we floated with our ropes still holding us, and the stream of water from the exhaust washing us away from the side of the vessel, while the swell of the sea urged us back against the side again. The resultant of all these forces was that we were carried parallel to the ship's side, and directly under boat number 14, which had filled rapidly with men and was coming down on us, in a way that threatened to submerge our boat. "'Stop lowering 14! our crew shouted and the crew of number 14, now only twenty feet above, cried out the same. The distance to the top, however, was some seventy feet, and the creaking of the pulleys must have deadened all sound to those above, for down she came, fifteen feet, ten feet, five feet, and a stoker and I reached up and touched the bottom of the swinging boat above our heads. The next drop would have brought her on our heads. Just before she dropped, another stoker sprang to the ropes with his knife open in his hand, one, I heard him say, and then two, as the knife cut through the pulley rope. The next moment the exhaust stream carried us clear, while boat number fourteen dropped into the water, taking the space we had occupied a moment before. Our gunnels were almost touching. We drifted away easily, and when our oars were got out we headed directly away from the ship. The crew seemed to me to be mostly cooks. They sat in their white jackets, two to an oar, with a stoker at the tiller, there was a certain amount of shouting from one end of the boat to the other, and the discussion as to which way we should go was finally decided by our electing as captain the stoker who was steering, and by all agreeing to obey his orders. He set to work at once to get in touch with the other boats, calling upon them, and getting as close to them as seemed wise, so that when search-boats came in the morning to look for us there would be more chance that, that all would be rescued. THE SINKING OF THE VESSEL It was now one o'clock in the morning. The starlit night was beautiful, but as there was no moon it was not very light. The sea was as calm as a pond. There was just a gentle heave as the boat dipped up and down in the swell. It was an ideal night, except for the bitter cold. In the distance the Titanic looked enormous. Her length and her great bulk were outlined in black against the starry sky. Every porthole and saloon was blazing with light. It was impossible to think that anything could be wrong with such a leviathan, were it not for that ominous tilt downwards in the bows, where the water was by now up to the lowest row of portholes. At about two o'clock we observed her settling very rapidly, with the bows and the bridge completely under water. She slowly tilted straight on end, with the stern vertically upwards, and as she did so, the lights in the cabins and the saloons, which had not flickered for a moment since we left, died out, flashed once more, and then went out altogether. At the same time, the machinery roared down through the vessel with a groaning rattle that could have been heard for miles. It was the weirdest sound, surely, that could have been heard in the middle of the ocean. It was not yet quite the end. To our amazement she remained in that upright position for a time which I estimate as five minutes. It was certainly for some minutes that we watched at least a hundred and fifty feet of the Titanic towering up above the level of the sea, looming black against the sky. Then, with a quiet slanting dive, she disappeared beneath the waters. Our eyes had looked for the last time on the gigantic vessel in which we set out from Southampton. Then there fell on our ears the most appalling noise that human being ever heard— the cries of hundreds of our fellow beings struggling in the icy water, crying for help with a cry that we knew could not be answered. We longed to return to pick up some of those who were swimming, 
but this would have meant the swamping of our boat and the loss of all of us. Reuter Mr. Lawrence Beasley went to Dulwich College as a science master in 1904, after having had two years' experience in teaching at Worksworth Grammar School. He was educated first at Derby School, where he took a scholarship, and afterwards at Keyes College, Cambridge, of which he was a scholar and prizeman. He took a first class in the Natural Science Tripos in 1903. An Officer's Adventures Sat Down with the Titanic Colonel Gracie of the United States Army jumped from the topmost deck of the Titanic when she sank, and was sucked down with her. On reaching the surface again, he swam until he found a cork raft, and then helped to rescue others. He gives the exact time of the sinking of the Titanic as 2.22 a.m., which was the hour at which his watch was stopped by his leap into the sea. He said, "'After sinking with the ship,' It appeared to me as if I was propelled by some great force through the water. This might have been occasioned by explosions under the water, and I remembered fearful stories of people being boiled to death. The second officer has told me that he has had a similar experience. I thought of those at home as if my spirit might go to them to say good-bye for ever. Again and again I prayed for deliverance, although I felt sure that the end had come. I had the greatest difficulty in holding my breath until I came to the surface. I knew that once I inhaled, the water would suffocate me. When I got under water, I struck out with all my strength for the surface. I got to the air again after a time which seemed to me to be unending. There was nothing in sight, save the ocean, dotted with ice and strewn with large masses of wreckage. Dying men and women all about me were groaning and crying piteously. No more room on the raft. The second officer and Mr. J. B. Thayer, Jr., who were swimming near me, told me that just before my head appeared above the water, one of the Titanic's funnels separated and fell apart near me, scattering the bodies in the water. I saw wreckage everywhere, and all that came within reach I clung to. At last, by moving from one piece of wreckage to another, I reached a raft. Soon the raft became so full that it seemed as if she would sink if more came on board her. The crew, for self-preservation, had therefore to refuse to permit any others to climb on board. This was the most pathetic and horrible scene of all. The piteous cries of those around us ring in my ears, and I shall remember them to my dying day. "'Hold on to what you have, old boy!' we shouted to each man who tried to get on board. "'One more of you would sink us all!' Many of those whom we refused answered as they went to their death, "'Good luck! God bless you!' All the time we were buoyed up and sustained by the hope of rescue. We saw lights in all directions. Particularly frequent were some green lights, which, as we learnt later, were rockets fired in the air by one of the Titanic's boats. So we passed the night, with the waves washing over and burying the raft deep in water." We prayed through all the weary night, and there was never a moment when our prayers did not rise above the waves. Men, who seemed long ago to have forgotten how to address their Creator, recalled the prayers of their childhood, and murmured them over and over again. Together we said the Lord's Prayer again and again. Reuter On board the Carpathia, how the passengers were received— a passenger on board the Carpathia made the following statement. I was awakened at twelve-thirty in the morning by a commotion on the decks which seemed unusual. There was no excitement, however, as the ship was still moving. I paid but little attention to the disturbance and went to sleep again. About three o'clock I was again awakened, and I noticed that the Carpathia had stopped. I went up on to the deck and found that our vessel had changed her course, the lifeboats had been sighted, and began to arrive one by one. There were sixteen of them in all. The transfer of the passengers was soon being carried out. It was a pitiable sight. Ropes were tied round the waists of the adults to help them in climbing up the rope ladders. The little children and babies were hoisted on to our deck in bags. Some of the boats were crowded, but a few were not half full. This I could not understand. Some of the people were in evening dress, while others were in their night clothes or wrapped in blankets. They were all hurried into the saloon at once for hot breakfast, of which they were in great need, 
as they had been in open boats for four or five hours in the most biting air I have ever experienced. There were husbands without their wives, wives without their husbands, parents without their children, and children without their parents, but there was no demonstration, and not a sob was heard. They spoke scarcely a word, and seemed to be stunned by the shock of their experiences. One of the women, and three of the others taken from the lifeboats, died soon after reaching our deck, and their bodies were lowered into the sea at five o'clock in the afternoon. The rescued had no clothing other than that which they were wearing, and a relief committee was formed, our passengers contributing enough to meet their immediate needs. The survivors were so close to the sinking steamer that they feared that the lifeboats would be sucked down into the vortex. On our way back to New York we steamed along the edge of the ice-field, which stretched as far as the eye could see. To the north there was no blue water to be seen at all. At one time I counted thirteen icebergs. One of the Carpathia's stewards, in an account of how the first boatload of passengers was rescued, said, "'Just as it was about half-day, we came upon a boat with eighteen men in it, but no women. It was not more than a third filled. All the men were able to climb up a Jacob's ladder, which we threw over the port side. Between 8.15 and 8.30 we got the last two boats, crowded to the gunwale, almost all the occupants of which were women.' After we had got the last load on board, the Californian came alongside. The captains arranged that we should make straight for New York, while the Californian looked round for more boats. We circled round and round, and saw all kinds of wreckage. While we were pulling in the boatloads, the women were quiet enough. But when it seemed sure that we should not find any more persons alive, then Bedlam came. I hope never to go through it again." The way those women took on for the folk they had lost was awful. We could not do anything to quiet them until they cried themselves out. The refusal of the operators on board the Carpathia to answer questions concerning the disaster is now explained. It was due to the physical exhaustion of both the men. They sent a large number of personal messages from survivors to friends ashore, and received replies from the latter. This work was deemed to be more important than the answering of questions from the shore. THE RESCUE BY THE CARPATHIA John Cool of Nebraska said, It was almost four o'clock in the morning, dawn was just breaking, when the Carpathia's passengers were awakened by the excitement occasioned by coming upon a fleet of life-saving boats. At that hour the whole sea was one mass of whitened ice. The work of getting the passengers over the side of the Carpathia was attended with the most heart-rending scenes. The babies were crying, many of the women were hysterical, while the men were stolid and speechless. Some of the women were barefooted and without any headgear. The impression of those saved was that the Titanic had run across the projecting shelf of the iceberg, which was probably buried in the water, and that the entire bottom of the Titanic had been torn off. Shortly afterwards she doubled up in the middle and went down. Most of the passengers did not believe that the boat was going to sink. According to their stories, it was fully half an hour before a lifeboat was launched from the vessel. In fact, some of the passengers keenly questioned the wisdom of Captain Smith's orders that they should leave the big ship. Dr. J. F. Kemp, the Carpathia's physician, says that their wireless operator happened by chance to have delayed turning in on Sunday night for ten minutes. Thus it was that he was at his post, and got the Titanic's call for help. Had he gone to rest, as usual, there would have been no survivors. Dr. Kemp describes the iceberg which sank the Titanic as being four hundred feet long and ninety feet high. The Carpathia cruised twice through the ice-field in the vicinity of the spot, and picked up the bodies of three men and a baby. These bodies were committed to the deep on Monday evening. Among the congregation at the funeral service were thirty widows, twenty of whom were under twenty-three years of age, most of them being brides of only a few weeks or months. End of The Sinking of the Titanic